One of the things I'm perhaps best well known for is my involvement in the Alien Autopsy film. It's one of those things that won't go away, it won't die. Uh, and it was resurrected again this year when a series of emails were released online. These emails formed a memo that was sent to US billionaire Bob Bigelow. And it's a summary of comments made by former CIA employee, Dr. Kit Green. He's an MD, PhD, did work for the CIA. And according to these 11 page document, Kit Green was shown film that looked the same as the alien autopsy back in the 1980s. However, the only UFO researcher that's named in this 11 page memo is me, it's yours truly. It describes how they contacted me way back in 2001. I can't escape it. The release of these, these emails did come as a surprise to, to many people, including the people that wrote them. I think it was certainly embarrassing for those that are, are mentioned in it. Dr. Kate Green, like I said, is an MD, and he also gives his professional medical opinion on the alien autopsy film. Regarding the authenticity of the, this email, I, th I think it's, it, it is authentic. The reason being, I had the email of one of those mentioned in it, and I contacted him, uh, and he confirmed that they were authentic. Uh, but he quickly added that since then, they'd changed their mind about the alien autopsy film. They now thought it was fake. And you could sense the embarrassment, even though it's come through on email. He asked me not to release his name, so I won't do, but he is mentioned in, in the emails. There's only four or five people mentioned in it, so you've you know, got a one in five chance of getting it right. The source of them it hasn't been proven yet, but I think I know where they came from, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. I've been involved in looking at Roswell probably from about 1993. Everybody knows a bit about Roswell, and the reason we're talking about it again is because of the alien autopsy. And interestingly, internal communications from the CIA have been released uh, where they're actually talking about alien autopsy back then and, and verifying that they had that they believe that the footage is real and they've seen it themselves. And it has been called the alien autopsy memo. It is a string of emails between a chap called Eric Davis and Dr. Kit Green. On this 11 page document, they are evaluating a number of things on which they were working on. But primarily, it is the alien autopsy film they're discussing. It's addressed to US billionaire Bob Bigelow, who used to run an organization called the National Institute for Discovery Science, NIDS. And he employed a number of scientists to study UFOs. One of those scientists is, is Dr. Kit Green. Kit Green formerly worked for the CIA. This email list is clarifying uh, statements made by Kit Green concerning the alien autopsy film. It's dated 2001. Without going into in too great a detail, he came to the conclusion, as did the, the others copied in on these emails, that the alien autopsy film, in his opinion, was real, and that he'd some, seen exactly the same type of film at a briefing at the Pentagon back in 1987 stroke 88. And it's caused quite an uproar yet again.
When you look at the consensus of UFO researchers around the world, and when it comes to these documents, uh, and it's like, oh no, not the alien autopsy again. I thought we'd done that. I thought we'd proved it's a fake. Let's move on, you know, let's forget about it, please. The, the leaked documents were sent to me by three different individuals the day before they were released online. I had no idea this was about to happen, but it just did. It is believed it has come from an archive of a well-known gentleman who had passed away. I'll not mention his name because it's not yet been verified. But it seems plausible enough. He was involved in UFO research. He's an extremely well-known gentleman, if I mention his name. And there is Houston, the computer shows. Thank you, you troops did a nice job down there. That was beautiful. Four minutes later, he was joined by Ed Mitchell. There's a number of people who are copied in on this email. And one of those who's copied in, I emailed them and asked them if the documents in question were authentic. And he said, off the record, Philip, yes, they are. The gentleman I contacted on email has refused to answer any more questions. And it would appear to me that both him and his colleagues who are mentioned in this document are embarrassed because this was an internal set of emails uh, and was never meant for public consumption. The only person so far to speak to Kit Green about this is, uh, is US uh, researcher Richard Dolan. You know, Richard has interviewed him on the telephone. And I think one of the first things he asked him was, is this email list, is it authentic? Uh, and he said, yes, it is. Another chap who worked for Robert Bigelow was a chap called Colm Kelleher. And he contacted me and he asked me to speak with, with Ray Santilli for him. What Colm was, was seeking at the time was a good quality copy of the alien autopsy film. And of course, some celluloid, some 16 millimeter film to analyze. So I did like I'd done many times before, put him in touch with Santilli and, and left them to it. The main gentleman mentioned in these documents who was commenting on the alien autopsy film is a gentleman called Christopher Kit Green. Everyone knows him as Kit Green. He's an MD, he's a PhD, and still practices medicine even now in the United States. Dr. Green, at one point, was employed by the CIA, worked on a number of projects for them in a variety of capacities. So he's, he's a, you know, a highly intelligent gentleman and, and one that's very well qualified as well. He claims that the briefing he was given in 1988-87 stroke was specifically about the alien autopsy. I think the main reason when you look at these documents is why they would want Kit Green to evaluate the alien autopsy film. There are two reasons. One is that in 1988-87, Kit Green himself says he was taken to the Pentagon and briefed and shown films that looked exactly the same as the alien autopsy film. But also, he's an MD, he's a medical doctor. So later in these documents, Dr. Kit Green looking at the alien autopsy film itself, nothing to do with any briefing he'd had at the Pentagon, but he gives his own medical opinion on what he sees on that film. And he says, I think it's real. 
a genuine article. Or what field of expertise do these people have dealing with anatomies of uh, alien beings? I assure you, none. We were learning. That was day one of school when they first cut into the first specimen. One time, there was a requirement for our OIC to go to, to Fort Belvoir, Virginia. So I went ahead and I was selected as the driver to take him to Fort Belvoir, Virginia. After we arrived there, he went to where the officers were meeting for a briefing. The drivers went to another location. There was myself and an, an airman first class, and we went inside to the balcony area, which had a, a text and glass cover over where we, where we could look down to where the officers were. When we looked down there, we found that they were watching films. We were watching and thinking, well, it has to be some type of uh, science fiction movies that they're watching, where they're splicing them together like uh, trailers at an end of a movie. We couldn't figure out what type of movies they were. So while we were talking amongst ourselves, we looked around, we had two gentlemen come in and told us we were to follow them. The airman and myself thought we were in trouble because we'd seen all these officers being brought, brought together with taxpayers' money, watching what we perceived to be uh, little clips from science fiction movies because I honestly didn't think that we would ever be in a position where I could be so easily exposed to something like that. However, after four days and five nights of that, I went ahead and finally convinced them that I wouldn't be discussing this situation. The interesting thing I found out when I first saw the films, the uh, films of the dissection, the word that I used to describe what I saw was haunting and it had a special significance to me because I was seeing images of what I saw in 1969 that brought back specific memories what happened to me is what they call intensified debriefing and I can tell you this much intensified debriefing you'll go ahead and you'll take sleep over food You'll get water, because see, it's important you have water, or you'll die. They'll provide you with food, but you slept in spurts. You'd go and lay your head down on the pillow. You'd go into what they call deep sleep. That's about three to five minutes, and you'd be woken up, and you'd be taken back, put under the lamps again for more intensified debriefing. And what they'd do, they knew that you were wondering what was going to happen to you. So it had an effect on you. And that's about the gist of it. Forgive me. Is Kit Green saying that the things he saw in the 1980s were similar or the same as the being in the 1995 Santilli film. He emphasizes it and actually spells it out in capital letters and says they are the same. Not similar, but the same. And of course, that's simply not possible. There are those that think that perhaps, you know, Ray Santilli is not behind the invention of the alien autopsy will not is Spiros Milaris, but instead, for some mysterious reason, it's the CIA. There are a number of well-known UFO researchers, primarily in the United States. I can't believe that someone of Kit Green's experience and standing would be fooled by a fake film. So there must be something more to it and uh, they believe that he was indeed shown other films, fake or real, by the CIA, that look either the same or similar to the Santilli film. Therefore, the CIA must, in some mysterious way, be linked to the faking of it. 
I can't see any sense in that at all and don't believe a word of it. It is alleged that the CIA have fed false stories about UFOs uh, into the public domain and for a variety of reasons. We do know for a fact that they did feed fake UFO sightings into the public domain to cover up overflights of this, their own spy plane. So they may have other reasons for putting fake alien stories into the public domain. If we jump back to Roswell, for example, some people claim that the alien aspect of it is a fake story to cover up what really did happen. But this is only speculation. Then you've got a scientist and a medical doctor being fed information by the CIA. Dr. Kit Green, who has now been interviewed by Richard Dolan, has changed his attitude somewhat. He believes now the film is a fake. And he says that the CIA lied to him back in the 80s. However, he does now still say that some of the film that he saw at the Pentagon, some of the aspects of it, like the creature's face and the hand and the room, were still the same as the Santilli film released in 1995. Now, whether it's the whole film or bits of it, they cannot be the same because the film was only designed and made in 1995. So nothing in it can be the same as something seen back in the 1980s. It is simply not possible. When Kit Green uh, does his evaluation, he notices a few small mistakes in the medical procedure, but then you know, he has an explanation of, of for why these mistakes may have been made, because it was back in 1947, they didn't do things the same then as they do now, and so it was the military, you know, and, and they had different ways of doing things. He speculates that if any tissue samples were taken, they would go to the Walter Reed Institution, which of course is based at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, which we have mentioned before, and it's links with UFO research. Although he's only speculating, he, he doesn't know this for sure, it's just pure speculation at that point. When you look at Dr. Kit Green's evaluation of the, the, the alien autopsy film, he doesn't get anything right and you think to yourself is he looking at the same film as me and because he mentions various medical items in it which you can't see you know they're just not there so it, it does make you wonder how he's come to these conclusions you know i've tried to get in touch with mr green to ask him a few questions the first one i would ask is how did a man of your reputation and experience come to be fooled by this fake film that would be my first question but unfortunately, I've not had that, uh, that chance yet. There's, there's a number of things that are important about the memo. It shows you how someone with the knowledge and experience of Dr. Kit Green can be fooled by a piece of film. He wasn't alone. At the time when the film was released around the world, there were a number of physicians who went on the record saying it looks pretty authentic as far as the medical procedure is concerned. However, they wouldn't comment on what the creature on the slab was. He's gone that one step further. So it just shows you the impact that this film had, not just when it was released, but you know, down the decades and still does continue to have uh, such an impact. I think the biggest revelation is that just when you think you've heard everything there is to hear about the alien autopsy film, and I have a huge archive of material on it, that something else appears and brings it back into the public domain again, and the argument starts from scratch. It was almost as if the 14 years I spent investigating it had been a complete waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> what is amazing is that 
race until it had been quiet for quite a while. But once this email document leaked, he was back on social media saying, I always knew that there were documents somewhere that would prove that what I'd been saying was correct all along. He's even done a couple of interviews on a couple of podcasts, still saying, yeah, I told you I had real film, I told you there was a mysterious cameraman. Well, he, you know, these documents don't prove anything, but he's using it to the best effect. Kit Green, CIA, in the papers that were released, said he'd seen my film before we'd published it. That purely verifies exactly what I've been saying all along. The film, the story is real, the film is real. Um, we did restore the film uh, in order that people can today see, you know, what, what happened in 1947. But, you know, we're not magicians. If he's seen the film before I published it or before we published it, then what does that tell you? It tells you that the film is real. It's good timing. There's been a lot of interest from the media, serious interest, since December 2017, when a gentleman called Luis Elizondo stepped forward, uh, giving details about a secret UFO study done by the United States Department of Defense. And a couple of video films were released of UFOs and so on. Dude, this is a control, bro. There's a whole fleet of them, look on the ASA. Oh my gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. Oh, all thing, dude. That's not an LNS though, is it? It's not. It is an LNS, dude. Well, the flares are moving, I think. It's rotating. These aircraft, we'll call them aircraft, are displaying characteristics that are not currently within the U.S. inventory nor in any foreign inventory that, that we are aware of. So I know you're using, uh, you're being clear, but I mean, the answer is yes. Um, my personal, I can't speak on behalf of the government. Obviously, okay. I'm, I'm not in the U.S. government anymore. My personal belief is that uh, there is very compelling evidence that we, uh, we may not be alone. U.S. billionaire Bob Bigelow has always had an interest in UFO research. Why in 2000, 2001, they would decide to try and analyze the alien autopsy film is anyone's guess. Maybe they'd seen it on a TV show or they'd looked at it online and thought perhaps it's a good idea. If a billionaire comes along with a money saying, I'm going to look at UFOs, well then, you know, people stood up and took notice. My own theory on why Kit Green and others in these emails state that they believe the alien autopsy was real was not to upset their paymaster which was Mr. Bigelow. I don't think Mr. Bigelow would be interested in fake stories. So they're playing to the audience, and the audience being Mr. Bigelow. They had a vested interest in, in keeping the mythology alive, if you like. When it comes to the, the UFO subject in, in general, and the argument that we are being visited by aliens from another world, Kit Green says in these documents, there's a number of reasons why there's a cover-up. And you know, he gives his own opinion for that. And one of those is that there is a, an elite you know, government cabal, if you like, or just another one is just that it's the right thing to do, but it doesn't explain why it's the right thing to do. But these are just his own personal opinions and are no more valid than yours or mine. The genesis 
of the alien autopsy film did not start with the CIA, did not start with Spiros Malaris, but began with a piece of film called the tent footage. And even that was not what it seemed. We can trace the origin of the alien autopsy film beyond Spiros. He may have made it, but he didn't come up with the idea. We go back to 1993. Ray Santilli used to work with some gentlemen at a company called AK Music in Milton Keynes. They used to have what we might call brainstorming sessions, fun brainstorming sessions. It was at one of these sessions that the alien autopsy film was born. Ray became, he claimed, in possession of this, again, via his mysterious military cameraman. He claimed this was, uh, you know, part of the film rolls he'd got. He was having them processed in some way or transferred onto video. And this was the, the first of the first batch to be to be done. And there was more to follow. But it all came from his, his former military cameraman. That's what he told us. In reality, of course, uh, that's not true. In the 1990s, I had a tip off from a gentleman who said, I know something about the alien autopsy film. He gave me his telephone number and cut a long story short, he said, the people you should be talking to are Keith and Andy at AK Music, that being Keith Bateman. Now, AK Music had closed, but I managed to find Keith Bateman. And he had, uh, as you may not be surprised, a very different story to tell about the so-called tent footage. My initial reaction upon viewing this so-called tent footage was a, a sigh of relief, to be honest. I, I was not convinced that I would see anything that we could do anything with, but here we had a piece of film. It lasts about eight minutes, I believe, or thereabouts. There are people in it whose faces are visible, albeit it's pretty dark, and there is an alleged alien lying on this slab. It's the kind of film I expected. It wasn't high quality. It looked like it could have been some kind of scrap film that had been forgotten, like Ray Santilli claimed it was. It had been left behind because it was so poor quality. You usually find with the best UFO videos are the ones that are the, <laughs> the worst to look at. This kind of fitted the bill, so to speak. It certainly got my attention. There is some bogus alien autopsy footage that someone else had done at the same time. Um, this was uh, stuff in a, in a garage or something. Uh, it had nothing to do with us at all. Keith Badman and Andy Price Watts are the people involved in that. Nothing to do with us. When I first found out what they were doing, we, I got upset with them and we tried to stop them because they were trying to ride off the back of everything we were doing. When I saw the tent footage, to be honest, it's the kind of film I expected to see. I expected something that might be a bit dark, degraded, scratched, you know, from the bottom of somebody's rubbish bin or whatever you want to call it. So I wasn't disappointed. Again, I'd been speaking to Sam Tilly for about a year and a half. I'd now actually seen some film. Film did exist.
Handy Pass Box and Keith Bagman had a video production company which we used at the time for various different projects. So they knew me. And as with most people, uh, you know, if I'm involved in a project, I generally tell people, um, you know, that what we're doing. So I carried on with the project. They knew I, that I was involved in it, and they came up with their own footage. And they knocked on my door and said, look, you know, we've got this footage, why don't you use this? Which was complete nonsense. Of course I'm not going to use it, we have the real thing. Why would I want to be bothered with something they've shot in their back garden? I discovered that it wasn't made uh, by some mysterious cameraman. It had in fact been made by Keith Bateman and his colleagues. The original film was actually even shot in colour. I thought that was the end of it. And then I realised that they would started going to, to press with the footage they had off the back of our story. And they've got our lawyers involved and we tried to stop them. I think they're try still trying to sell it, saying I was involved in it, but was never involved in it. A race until he later went to say that what really happened with the tent footage is that he gave AK Music some 16 millimeter film to be transferred onto video and unbeknown to him it was so badly damaged that they couldn't do that and that AK Music went away and made this piece of tent footage and brought it back to him and told him that that was the film that they'd recovered from this reel so in fact he'd been hoaxed that was his excuse for removing it from production. They played a prank on him, but in reality, had the film got out, then there was every chance that the individuals on it could have been recognised and, of course, could be tracked down. I would have found out that it wasn't made in 1947, it was made in 1993 in a barn in Bedfordshire. What you see is uh, a creature laid on a slab. It's mostly covered by a, a blanket or, or a sheet. You can see its head. Beyond it are two gentlemen in white coats. They seem to be handling some fleshy material and you see a flash now and again that looks like some kind of implement or knife. There is an old fashioned lamp hanging up. And then from time to time, there's a gentleman with his back to the camera walks in and out occasionally. So it is claimed that this is the on-site on inspection, if you like, the tent footage of the creatures in Roswell, New Mexico. And that's the first piece of film that I was shown, that Reg Presley was shown, that other researchers were shown before the alien autopsy that we know. When we were at last invited to Ray Sandilli's office to view some film. We'd no idea what to expect. Ray hadn't explained, either in writing or on the telephone, what this film looked like. You know, I was quite surprised. I, I thought we'd see something that was far worse than this, that would be blurry and out of focus, or maybe something in the distance. So I, I tried to concentrate as much as I could and taking all these images in just in case we never saw it again. When I got to speak to Keith Bateman, he lives on the south coast, a long way from my house, he told me how in 1993 he was having a brainstorming session with Ray Santilli. There was a few of them and they used to have a bit of fun and come up with crazy ideas. Apparently, Ray Santilli said, it'd be nice if we had some Roswell footage. Just so happened that one of Keith's employees, a chap called Philip Yarman, was reading a UFO book. And in that book, it had several pages 
about Roswell. So Keith had a bing, a light bulb <laughs> moment and decided to make some Roswell footage. He made the head of the alien out of a polystyrene head that he used to put a wig on. He enlarged the eyes in it and blacked them out, put some, I think he put either lemon or orange peel and, and blacked it out with a pen. Under the sheet, you can see a body under the sheet. It's not the alien, it's actually Keith's son lying still. The two gentlemen in white coats, uh, one is another one of Keith's employees. The other one is a, a local butcher. Now they went to the local butcher for some fleshy material, some giblets, uh, well, some offal. So when you see these two gentlemen in white coats handling a fleshy-like material in the distance, that it is indeed flesh, but it's, it's animal flesh. And the man who walks with his back to the camera every now and again is a farmer. They filmed it on a farm in Bedfordshire. So, uh, you know, he got in on the act as well. He even asked one of his uh, colleagues who worked for him to lie under the cloth first, but he's disabled. He's in a wheelchair, so he couldn't get up on the table. So uh, the reserve was, was, was Keith's son. And if you look at it closely, you can see his head bent to one side like that. It's actually Keith's son underneath the sheet. Keith originally shot it in colour. He ran it through the computer. His colleague Philip, who he employed, put scratches on it and aged it and made it look old. There's no soundtracks, so they changed it to black and white. And they presented this -da -da, to Ray Santilli. He knew it was fake, he knew they'd made it. Ray said, that's not good enough, it's not clear enough. Uh, go away and get me a budget for something better. So Keith Bateman told us, I went and got a budget, he won't say from where or who he spoke to, and it was 30, 40,000 pounds, something in that nature, and Ray said, no, that's too much, forget about it. However, Ray kept the tent footage. You know, the blue touch paper had been lit, so it was made in a barn in Bedfordshire by Keith Bateman and his colleagues. I've spoken to Keith's colleagues, I've spoken to Philip Yarman, and uh, they've all confirmed what Keith is saying is, is correct. When the television companies became involved, certainly Fox in the United States, they were presented with a package of film for use. That package consisted of two minutes of the tent footage. One of the autopsy films. And the debris film. At the last moment, Ray pulled the tent footage and, and asked them not to use it. And he came up with a story that the cameraman didn't recognize it. Now, I wasn't sure about it. But of course, we know the reason. The reason was, is that it was 100% fake. And the people on it, you could see their faces. As <laughs> simple as that. And the thing about this tent footage that makes it a blatant hoax is that all the people involved, you know, pretty much have gone on the record and King still has the film in colour. What is interesting is that 
this was the piece of film that Ray Santilli showed to everybody uh, and used it as kind of bait. It was even the film that he showed first off to Spiros Malaris and said, I've spent a lot of money in, in making this film and you're telling me it's not real, that it's fake. Because uh, it was always shot on video, it was never shot on, on celluloid. So it was used as a bait for everyone. Ray had, a, had an excuse for everything. You know, you would point something out that would co contradict what he'd been saying, and he, he'd come up with an excuse for it. But you don't have to believe me. You can speak to Keith and these colleagues, uh, like I have. They're all there. They'll tell you what happened. They'll tell you the origins of the alien autopsy film. It's certainly not with the CIA. And it's certainly not with respect to Spiros Molaris. It's happened at this little uh, meeting they had, this brainstorming session, and it was just an off-the-cuff remark. Wouldn't it be great if we had some Roswell footage? Keith does have a wicked sense of humour, and he went away and made it. And had that not have happened, there would have been no alien autopsy, and we would not be sitting here today talking about it. <laughs> Of course, when we come to Ray Santilli today, he still maintains that he did indeed meet this mysterious military cameraman, who did indeed show him some alien autopsy film. And he may even have had a few scraps of it, you know, a few frames of it, and that he recreated it, or restored it, as, as he calls it. But in other words, the film you see now is, is, is in fact not real, which is what he did say back in 1995. So he still stands by the story of meeting this mysterious cameraman. Had Keith Bateman and his colleagues not have made the tent footage, then Ray Santilli would not have had any bait to use, therefore he would not have been able to tell a fake story to Spiros Malaris, who then in turn wouldn't have been able to come up with the idea to make the fake alien autopsy film that you know eventually went around the world to fool you know millions of people. It simply would not have happened. <laughs>